you. Christmas 1999. English conductor John Elliott Gardiner starts off on an extraordinary musical journey. With his Monteverdi choir and the English Baroque soloists, he plans to perform the entire body of Johann Sebastian Bach's church cantatas in the year 2000. Bach wrote special cantatas for each Sunday and festival day in the church calendar. Gardiner's aim is to perform them on precisely these days. Starting point for the Bach Cantata pilgrimage is the city of Weimar in Thuringia. Gardner begins his tour in the famous Herder Church with the six cantatas of the Christmas Oratorio. I find it immensely moving walking into this church last night. Uh, it's beautiful Herder Kirche. It's the town church of Weimar. Uh, Bach's children, three of his sons, were baptized here. And even though Bach himself was working over in the Schloss, which is now um, destroyed, uh, the connections between him and this church are very, very close. I mean, for instance, his cousin, uh, Johann Gottfried Walter, was the um, organist here in exactly the same time that Bach himself was working, working here in Weimar. And I found it a very, very beautiful church. And with the Kanach altarpiece at the back, suddenly to hear the music of the Weihnachts Oratorium, of the Christmas Oratorium in this building, just brought the whole thing alive for me. And it was just such a moving um, beginning to what's now going to be 53 continuous weeks of Bach cantatas. The project, with over 80 concerts and CD recordings, is John Elliott Gardner's personal homage to Johann Sebastian Bach. For years, the conductor and his wife, Isabella, have been planning this massive undertaking. Choir and orchestra yes, have been okay. rehearsing for months, right, preparing for guys, this moment. Media interest is lively. Right. Radio and That's television right. teams are in constant attendance. But there's a problem with this television camera, I don't know. Yep. Where are the solos? John Elliott Gardner explains why he's starting his pilgrimage with the Christmas Oratorio. Bach's Christmas Oratorio begins with the cantata Jauchzut Frau Locket, um, Rejoice. It's it, from the very opening timpani fanfare and, and then the way that the instruments um, accumulate and, and build up a, a huge head of steam, as it were, you're aware that, that some hugely important festival and exciting event is going to happen on Earth. And it, this, this ex opening chorus um, of part one of the Christmas Oratorio has all the elements that make Bach's th the most euphoric composer that, that's ever existed, in a way. Um, it begins with the timpani, then come the, the various instruments, the, the flutes, the oboes, the trumpets building up to head of steam until this big unison outburst of the chorus of Jauchz at Frohlocket, Christians Rejoice. Uh, it's a long uh, and um, extended uh, fanfare, as it were, to the piece. Bach 
Bach's music for the second day of Christmas in his Christmas Oratorio contains really the essence of what Christmas means to so many people. It contains the appearance of the angel to the shepherds. It represents also the reaction of the whole of the Christian congregation and the Christian community to the events of Christ's nativity. And it starts with one of the most beautiful orchestral pieces that ever came out of the 18th century, the famous Pastoral Symphony. written for two flutes and for four oboes. It gives it a wonderful kind of pastoral buzz and a drowsiness, but at the same time, a feeling of, of, of great sensuality and tenderness, which is fitting for the birth of Christ. The Christmas Oratorio, despite its incredible rigor and its the discipline and almost mathematical proportions that, that govern it, there is the sense that from that, the, the, the human spirit is allowed to float and to fly free. He tells us what it is, it's like to be a human being as part of the universe, and he tells us how our aspirations are to a Godhead, to a life beyond. Could we just do the last bar, last two bars? Three? Three, last three bars. Bar 61, and... Yeah. Everybody needs to listen to the oboes to, to an exact. You can anticipate where their attack is going to be on the last note. Just to do it once again, the last full bar. The, sorry, the last two bars now. Last two bars. And the backbone of these six cantatas is the uh, uh, biblical narrative. The the Gospels of St. Matthew and St. Luke delivered by an evangelist, by the tenor in this case. Now the difference between that and, and the uh, other great um, oratorios of Bach, the St. Matthew and the St. John Passion, is that these events uh, have much less direct speech um, than the Passions do. There's very l much less opportunity for um, a dramatic um, uh, realization of the text. In fact, the only two named characters who sing are the angel and Herod. Um, for the rest, it's done in indirect speech. But this is the linking device that Bach uses to, to maintain the momentum, the dramatic momentum, through the, all six pieces. Okay, here's number two coming up. Shh, hush, please. Verzeihung. Es ist zu viel Geräusch hier. Wir können nicht proben, wenn es gibt so viel Geräusch. Bitte schön. Es begab sich aber zu der Zeit, dass ein Gebot von dem Kaiser Augusto ausging, dass alle Welt geschätzt würde. Und jedermann ging, dass er sich schätzen ließe, ein jeglicher in seine Stadt. Da machte sich auch auf Josef aus Galiläa, aus der Stadt Nazareth, in das jüdische Land, zur Stadt David, die da heißt Bethlehem. The role of the evangelist in the Christmas Oratorio, as in, in the other uh, big works, the Passions, is really to tell the story. But I think it happens on three levels. You, on the one hand, you, you tell the story as it happened or supposed to happen. And on the other hand, I think also bring, Bach brings in a kind of interpretative um, color of his own. So in a way, he, the evangelist, at the same time as he tells the story, he also interprets what he is saying. Es waren Hirten in derselben Gegend auf dem Felde bei den Hürden, die hüteten des Nacht ihre Herde. Und siehe, es Herren Engel trat zu ihnen, und die Kleid des Herren leuchtet um sie. Und sie furchten sich sehr. 
part three of the Christmas Oratorio by Bach starts and finishes with the most wonderful triple rhythm dance, a chorus, Herrscher des Himmels, ruler of the heavens, uh, encourage us in our prayer. Uh, then the shepherds uh, step center stage, as it were, and sing, let us now go even to Bethlehem. There's the most magnificent duet, almost a love duet, for the soprano and bass. And the heart of the cantata is the alto aria, Schließe mein Herz. And this is one of the few arias which Bach composed specially for the Christmas Oratorio. And it's the most intimate piece, accompanied by violin obbligato and the alto soloist. great. Thank you. That's all of the rehearsal tonight. It was a heck of a day, but thank you for making it so joyous at the end. And you feel now and again in the Christmas Oratorio that there are um, also these sensations of, of, of nature at work, of, almost of, of, of the buzzing of the bees, as it were, and, 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 and of, of insects and, and uh, bird life and so on, of, of all coming together. And, um, I, I think that um, that Douglas Adams has got it absolutely right when he said, this is the music of flocking and swarming things, of things that flow and bubble and rise and, f and fall and fizz, of things tense and constrained that suddenly fly free. And I, I think that sums up really what, what I feel about Bach in, in his kind of euphoric and ecstatic mood, that it's music that flies free and that despite its incredible rigor and its the discipline and um, uh, almost mathematical proportions that, that govern it, there is the sense that from that the, the, the human spirit is allowed and to float and to fly free. And that's one of the distinctive marks of Bach and what distinguishes him from, say, Mozart, who in his operas conveys the whole uh, range of human emotions of the, the human situation, both in its absurdity and in its elevated state, or uh, distingu distinguishes him from Beethoven, whose music tells us a lot about Beethoven, a lot about what it is to be Beethoven and what it is to, to feel intensely and to take on the universe and to be, to, to be struggling with the universe and, and, uh, and to, to grapple with all those elemental forces. Bach does it in a much more straightforward way. He tells us what the universe is really like. He tells us what it is, it's like to be a, a human being as part of the universe and he tells us how our aspirations are to a godhead to a life beyond. Good, that's sounding better, but we must have you both on a rostrum. One of the things that nobody's wholly satisfactorily explained is the standard that Bach reached with his choir and with his instruments um, in the Thomaskirche and the, and the Nikolaikirche in, in Leipzig. That's it. Did the audiences of that day experience absolutely sublime performances conducted by the master of his own works, or did they, at the other extreme, hear what we might call a travesty? Were things so desperately out of tune because 
uh, the kids were cold, the organ had gone sharp, the harpsichord had gone flat, the instruments were squawking, the strings were snapping. What was going on? Um, we just, we, we, we don't know. Uh, what we do know is that Bach was uncompromising in the difficulty of some of the solo parts and the obligato uh, lines that he gave his singers and his players. That's, that's absolutely clear. Um, whether he accepted a huge kind of error factor in his performances, we don't know. Um, and it would be the most total bogus misuse of authenticity to try and reproduce that. Uh, what we're trying to do is to do the best, to give it our best shot. And that's an incredibly difficult thing to do in the sense that these instruments, particularly the reed instruments and the brass instruments, are treacherous. Um, they're technically fallible instruments. That's why they were replaced in the 19th century by much more technologically superior models. But what you lose with the technologically superior models is the particular color and sound and um, flavor, as it were, of these instruments. Rock solos are playing on either originals or copies of instruments that Bach would have known. Why? Well, Bach lends himself to all manner of interpretation. I believe that there's an um, uh, I believe that there's an interpretation of Bach's Brandenburg Number no. Three, conducted by Otto Klemperer, and one uh, contemporary one done by Reinhard Goebel which are exactly twice the length of each other, a hundred percent change in tempo, and probably both are legitimate in the sense that Bach does allow a whole diversity of different interpretive approaches to his music, and uh, maybe that's the secret to its universality. <laughs> Thank you. 
one out. Uh, There's not enough bass in relation to the other three voices. Uh -huh. yeah, but you may need that. Um. You may need it. <laughs> I have, I've got it. You may need it, but this, um, mm -hmm. the, the, the palpum were a little bit too loud. Now it's a little bit better. No, mm -hmm. it, it's just too much pr it's presence. Coming. Yeah. Be careful with the double bass. Mm -hmm. Now what? Yeah. Let's see the hear a bit of this. Of, uh, 12 or 36. <laughs> It amazes me the amount of flack that Bach has received for uh, using material that originated with secular pieces, secular cantatas, um, and reused it in, in a piece like the Christmas Oratorio, the Weihnachts Oratorium. Uh, why, why on earth should that be a problem? Um, it was a practice that uh, was current uh, in the 18th century. All composers used it. Um, Handel was much more extreme. Um, he would, uh, he seemed to need a kick start. He sometimes had writer's block, and he re he seemed to require a theme, even a pretty banal theme from a, um, a minor composer, to get him going. Now that never happened with Bach. Um, what Bach did, and it was usually when he was under pressure, a uh, time constraint, was to look back and see what he'd composed and see if the, if things could be used um, to save time um, and would still fit appropriately the occasion for which he was now writing. has this ability, despite his provincial, very particular local context here in Lutheran Germany, to leap over all barriers, uh, regardless of class, regardless of musical uh, upbringing, regardless of, of, of nationality and so on, and to be accessible to people. And why is that? I, well, I think it's because his music has this extraordinary rhythmical energy. It's, it's related to dance, it's related to the cycle of the seasons, it's related to something that's very, very primitive in a sense. But I think behind that there is also the fact that he's a compassionate individual, that he has a sense of us as individuals and all the tribulations that we go through at different stages in our lives. And I do believe that in a time when we're weighed down, as it were, by wallpaper music, by uh, the pollution of noise and by uh, the, the, the difficulties of getting out of our own environment, that Bach gives us a glimpse of the divine, of the sacred. I think the Christmas Oratorio is a wonderful launch pad for this voyage of discovery of all these other cantatas of Bach's. Uh, and yet, apart from about five or six of them, they're not really well known at all. And it's one thing for me as a musician and with my colleagues to study the music, but it's quite another actually to perform them and to perform them in such a wide context in different churches to so many diverse types of audience all over Europe.